Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. We welcome all of you to this webinar hosted by the Unit of Applied Neurobiology and the University of Edinburgh. We are deep grateful with the speakers and the participants. I am Sebastian Lipina and together with Nicolas Chevalier and Soledad Segretin, we organize this meeting with the main aim to address and discuss the conceptual and methodological advances in the study of adaptation processes in the evaluation of cell regulation development. To approach this objective, six experts in this field will present their considerations based on the four main questions that we included in the program. After the presentations, we will devote time for questions, about 30 minutes. We already have the questions that the participants sent us uh, during the registration process. But uh, you can also send questions during the webinar through the Zoom or the U YouTube chat sections. We are now pleased to introduce uh, our first speaker. Please, Nick, the room is yours. <laughs> All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Nick Chevalier, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Mariah. So Mariah uh, D. Joseph is a fourth year developmental psychology PhD student and Ford Foundation Predoctoral Fellow at the University of Minnesota's Institute of Child Development. She investigates how the type and timing of childhood poverty influences adaptive self-regulation development across different levels, including behavior, physiology, and the brain. And she directs the Next Gen Psych Scholars Program and is a recipient of the University of Minnesota uh, President's um, Student Leadership and Service Award, as well as grants that support her research and uh, engagement efforts. Hi everyone, my name is Mariah D. Joseph and I'm a fourth year developmental psychology PhD student at the University of Minnesota. As a trainee, I feel extremely fortunate to be given the opportunity to speak alongside some incredible scientists who I've long admired and who have influenced much of my own work. My growing program of research investigates the role of poverty on children's neurodevelopment and physiological self-regulation. And in this talk, I'll be highlighting some of my recent work in this area. But before I begin, I wanted to express my gratitude for my core mentors who have supported my training, especially my advisors, Dan Berry and Katie Thomas, as well as my dissertation committee members, Ann Mastin and Willen Frankenhus, and finally, my mentors from my pre-grad school days, Clancy Blair and Sibel Raver. I also want to recognize all the awesome grad students in my labs and at ICD who make science fun and rewarding, and finally, the Ford Foundation for my funding. So here's an overview of where we're going, where I'll aim to address the questions provided by the, by the organizers. I'm going to start with discussing some of the guiding theoretical frameworks I adopt to examine adaptive self-regulation in the context of poverty. Then without going too into the weeds, I'll attempt to make an argument for the importance of careful measurement work in this area with examples from some of my recent research. Throughout, I'll highlight measurement-related challenges to studying poverty and self-regulation and discuss ways of approaching those challenges empirically. Finally, I'll lay out some future directions and broader implications. So there are many ways to define and operationalize self-regulation. The way I like to think about it is rooted in the developmental systems framework, which characterizes all developmental phenomena as multi-level with bi-directional interactions occurring across these levels over time. Self-regulation, then, is a dynamic and self-organizing process, deeply embedded in environmental context, and supports the modulation of emotions, behavior, and physiology in service of goal-directed actions. Broadly, self-regulation is often used as an umbrella term consisting of subcomponents such as executive attention, delayed gratification, and physiological stress responsivity patterns. Together, it's thought that the suite of self-regulation skills supports positive outcomes. However, there's work to suggest that there are important differences in self-regulatory strategies that may serve as more adaptive in contexts such as economic scarcity or hardship. And this points to an important caveat of self-regulation. Self-regulation as it's commonly used 
is not synonymous with its characterization as adaptive. And while the prevailing deficit model, which aims to describe how poverty undermines brain and self-regulation development, has provided foundational insights into, into the consequences of poverty on self-regulation, and especially physiological indices of self-regulation, this approach by itself results in an incomplete understanding of the many nuanced ways experiences in the context of poverty come to shape children's self-regulation abilities. And leaders in the field have also come forth challenging the deficit model and the ways we've measured and defined self-regulation across levels of behavior in the brain, highlighting the need to root this work in more socioculturally valid ways. This requires us to rethink the way we frame our research questions and the tasks we use to capture self-regulation, considering that much of the early research was informed by educated white and affluent Western populations. Supporting this reframing, one emerging adaptation framework from Willem's team suggests that in addition to an increased risk of negative outcomes from poverty, children experiencing economic hardship may also develop enhanced abilities cultivated by adapting to challenges in their environments. Of course, there are also moderating influences of resilience factors at play too. Collectively, this approach requires tasks that allow these stress adapted abilities to manifest as well as significant consideration for the influences of lived experience. So how do we map the diverse array of poverty related experiences onto self regulation development. So SES indices have been the dominant approach, serving as a catch all proxy of such experiences. And while these indices are useful if the goal is to make broad predictions, income and parental education in and of themselves do not directly affect the brain. So to capture these more proximal and malleable environmental experiences that are posited to shape mechanisms underlying adaptive self-regulation skills, I draw from the dimensional model of adversity pictured here on the right. You'll notice over here that I further distinguish the meaning of deprivation for the context of poverty using measures that more directly index subjective material hardship and how children's home environments confer opportunities for sociocognitive stimulation. I also wanna point out that while distinguishing between key domains of experience is likely to yield empirical benefits, this approach is not equipped to capture the rich complexities of lived experiences for youth in poverty. And so it's critical to keep in mind the ways in which structural, racial, and social inequalities exert cascading effects on resource scarcity and family well-being. So being mindful of these constraints, this approach nonetheless holds the potential for revealing mechanistic patterns of self-regulation development in the face of economic hardship. A significant challenge in understanding how dimensions of experience map onto self-regulation lies in the extent to which our measures are socioculturally valid representations of those constructs. So in other words, the validity of environmental measures and the tasks that tap self-regulation really depends on whether they reflect common substantive and quantitative scales across groups in time or measurement invariance. So let's take an example. Say we have an item on our sociocognitive resources dimension that says, has a toy appropriate for grasping or mouthing? Affluent families in the US probably have many of such conventional toys while well, families in poverty or maybe families in other countries might have fewer of those toys, yet other non-conventional items that fulfill the same developmental purpose. A typical summary or mean score would suggest lower levels of sociocognitive resources for the low-income family, despite the true latent construct actually being identical across groups. And when the underlying meaning of a construct differs across groups or development, or when a measure is non-invariant, it undermines the ability to interpret differences because measurement differences are confounded with substantive differences. One way that my colleagues and I have empirically tested and adjusted for measurement non-invariance is by applying moderated nonlinear factor analysis or MNLFA, which I won't go into now, but here's a paper for more information if you're interested in learning the method. For now, let's take a quick look at some examples using this M and LFA method. So here's a snapshot of some findings from a prospective longitudinal sample of 1,000 children living in poverty with M and LFA growth rates for sociocognitive resources on the left and raw sums on the right, with age on the x-axis 
and these red trajectories corresponding to white children and blue corresponding to black children. Broadly, this shows key differences between scoring approaches that resulted in substantively different conclusions across racial groups and age that have far reaching implications for policy and theory. Another analysis from the large neuroimaging data set, the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study, we found substantial measurement non invariance or biases in these environmental measures as a function of multiple sociodemographic factors. And empirically adjusting for those via MNLFA afforded more precise effects for the link between poverty and environmental factors on individual differences in brain networks supporting self regulation, which this interaction shows. Thus, a key benefit of MNLFA is that it increases confidence that associations between environmental dimensions and neurodevelopment are driven by variation at the construct level rather than by measurement artifact. Perhaps one of the biggest benefits of this measurement approach is that it permits apples to apples comparisons, not only across groups, but also developmental time. And this allows us to more accurately and rigorously examine the role that timing of these experiences have on self-regulation development. This is particularly critical given how many theoretical models in development, some of which are depicted here, stress the importance of timing. Yet, few empirical studies to date have been methodologically equipped to test the role of timing and patterns of dose and chronicity of poverty-related experiences, leaving open questions about how and when biological embedding manifests. However, disentangling the effects of a complex dynamic environment that unfolds over time is definitely no easy feat. There's a lot of possible confounds. So how can we address this challenge of time? Using the same longitudinal sample I showed two slides ago, my team and I are currently adopting causal inference approaches to isolate the effects of each of these environmental experiences on physiological self-regulation, indexed by measures of stress reactivity during a social stress task when children were 13. To do this, we adopted marginal structural models which uses a weighting approach to create models that functionally act like a repeated random assignment of each environmental dimension. And in so doing, you can compare the effects of every possible exposure history. For example, effects of high exposure early followed by low exposure late. Let's take a look at some preliminary findings that help to illustrate the power of this causal inference approach. I'll begin with the effect of material deprivation exposure on predicted alpha amylase responses, indexing sympathetic regulation. So just to orient you, this gray dashed line is the effect of low exposure in infancy, toddlerhood, and childhood. And the predicted trajectories that follow are shown so that warmer colors represent two or more doses of high exposure, whereas the cooler colors represent only one dose of high. Low exposure is defined as the 25th percentile value of material deprivation, and high is the 75th. And all of these colored sequences are compared to this low, low, low sequence to ask the question of whether certain sequences statistically differ from having little to no exposure at all. So starting from the top of the legend down, here's the effect for chronically high deprivation exposure, followed by the sequences with two doses of high, and then with the cooler colors representing one dose, we have the effect of high only in childhood, high only in infancy, and high only in toddlerhood. The bolded lines, which are also starred in the legend, <clears throat> represent the sequences that were significantly different from low at all time. So here, all sequences with one to two high doses were significantly different from low at all time. And timing of these doses may matter with at least one high dose in toddlerhood corresponding to a more hyper reactivity pattern. Whereas sequences that have a low dose in toddlerhood followed by a high dose in childhood get these more hypo reactivity patterns or this yellow and green at the bottom. Now let's quickly zoom out a bit um, to show a collection of our preliminary findings across multiple physiological systems. So here's the putative causal impacts for the timing of threat on cortisol and RSA responses or HPA and parasympathetic reactivity to the social stressor. And then here we have the effects for the timing of material deprivation on alpha amylase, which I just walked you through, 
and blood pressure, indexing sympathetic regulation. So there's obviously a lot to unpack here, but broadly, these findings illustrate the complex individual differences in the ways children's stress response systems adapt to changing environmental demands in the context of poverty-related experiences, highlighting how important timing is in disentangling these complexities. Revealing these patterns and how they align with other behavioral outcomes can inform what we consider to be adaptive or maladaptive and further spur the creation of more individualized programs and policies that supports accessible self-regulation across diverse contexts. So switching gears a bit um, to consider future directions and more broadly implications for scientific theory building is this tension between whether self-regulation is composed of discrete or modular components or whether it's an interactive and dynamic self-organizing process. Pictured here is an illustration of this tension taken from an excellent workshop my lab mates and I went to from researchers at Radboud University. So theoretically, we think of adaptive self-regulation as an interactive dynamic system, especially given the developmental systems framework I mentioned earlier, which is even mimicked in this illustration here. Yet many of us in the field primarily adopt questions and methods that reflect a component dominant approach. This interactive framework on the left is drawn from complexity science and is increasingly being used in examining resilience processes and neural network analyses with some extensions into other indices of physiology. As complexity science methods become more accessible, I think this is a particularly exciting future direction that has the potential to draw novel mechanistic insights into how we understand self-regulation in context. And somewhat related to this component versus interaction tension is whether and how cognitive learning processes, which typically reflect a component dominant approach from cognitive science, interact with physiological self-regulation to cultivate learning behaviors and strategies and related outcomes to manifest. Most of the learning literature is limited to adult populations but there's been a recent surge of exciting research in computational and developmental neuroscience that is investigating how these processes develop in children. A current gap in this area of work and thus an important future direction is how poverty and, and even adversity more broadly influences these multi-level learning mechanisms and under which ecological conditions they are impacted. And as mentioned earlier, being sure to move beyond deficit frameworks and towards more integrative and adaptation-based approaches will be important in informing strengths-based interventions in education. And this is an area of inquiry I'm currently pursuing in my dissertation work. Finally, an important future direction and implication for scientific progress in the field more broadly rests on the importance of engaging with and investing in the next generation of diverse scholars to enhance the questions we ask, the methods we use to capture diverse lived experiences, and ensure that the conclusions we draw are rooted in context and integrity. And this requires building pipelines via community-based participatory research and or engagement with marginalized and economically disadvantaged youth, mentoring first-gen college students, and championing diverse trainees to remove barriers to success in academia. Ensuring that the voices of these communities and the scholars from them are amplified and celebrated will spur meaningful progress in the field. Pictured here is a program I direct that targets aspiring and current PhD students. And I highlight it because while there are many variations of programs like this, we're particularly fortunate to have substantial university financial support that actually pays grad students, particularly those underrepresented in academia as consultants. And this is a unique model we hope more universities adopt for creating sustainable and equitable solutions to psychology's longstanding diversity challenges. To close, um, highlighting some key takeaways based on the initial three questions the organizers put forth. I discussed how self-regulation is a dynamic and multi-level phenomena rooted in context and integrating deficit and adaptation models of adversity are important for understanding how poverty influences adaptive self-regulation development. It'll be important to identify and find ways of leveraging stress-adapted self-regulatory strategies for success in non-stress contexts. Next, I gave theoretical reasons for applying dimensional models of adversity to the study of poverty and outlined why careful measurement work of these dimensions 
matters for generating socioculturally valid conclusions that have the potential to inform more individualized programs. Further, examination of additional features of these experiences, such as timing and chronicity, has important implications for science and policy. Finally, I highlighted some future theoretical and empirical directions and discuss the importance of building a more inclusive team of scholars to enhance research in this area. And with that, I wanted to thank the organizers and speakers a part of this exciting symposium and to participants for your attention. I look forward to the live discussion. Thank you, Mariah, for your presentation. And now we are going to introduce our second speaker, Danielle Rubinov. Well, she's an assistant professor and licensed clinical psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. In her program of research, she examines how childhood adversity can affect early biological and behavioral mechanisms that increase children's risk for developing for developing poor psychological health, as well as different protective factors that promote resilience. The particular focus of her research is on developing and evaluating personalized dyadic interventions with parents with depression and their children. Her work has been founded by federal, state, and private foundation grants and recognized with early career awards from the Association for Psychological Sciences and American Psychosomatic Society. We are now going to share her presentation. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to give this presentation and be part of this really fantastic panel of speakers. My name is Danielle Rubinov, and I'm an assistant professor and clinical psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. I focus on the periods of infancy and toddlerhood and early childhood in my research. So when I was considering the development of self-regulation during these periods, I kept coming back to this idea that the parent child or the caregiver child dyad is really so central to the development of self-regulation early in life. So today I'll be focusing specifically on the role of the dyad as it relates to the development of children's regulatory abilities. So because self-regulation is such a broad construct, I wanted to begin with one definition that I think describes or, or captures it really well. So self-regulation refers to primarily volitional cognitive and behavioral processes that are meant to maintain levels of arousal that are conducive to positive adjustment and adaptation. That is a mouthful, uh, and it's a complicated definition, but really at the heart of it, self-regulation is referring to these processes that are enacted to attain a particular goal. Sometimes there are volitional processes and sometimes they're not. Now, because self-regulation is so broad, it is something that spans multiple domains of functioning and, and it can involve measurement across a variety of different domains so motor physiological social emotional cognitive and behavioral and some have referred to all of these different aspects of self-regulation as the self-regulation universe uh, self-regulation has also been described as having both uh, bottom up and top down components and by bottom up, uh, this is referring to things that are more automatic, they're more reactive. Um, top down are those things that are more effortful, they're more deliberate, they're the, the non-automatic processes. And it's important to note that self-regulation also occurs in the context of, of challenge or stress. It's a process that is, is triggered or, or unfolds when there is some sort of demand, either internal or external, that requires a person or a system to change. So we really do need to be looking at the, the context in which all of these processes are unfolding. Now, uh, when we shift to thinking about self-regulation -reg specifically in young children, um, it requires that we really reorient to thinking about the dyad, because really early in life, self-regulation is developing 
through the dyadic interactions that children are having with their caregivers. And within these, these dyadic processes, each member of the dyad both regulates and is regulated by the other members of the, the other member of the dyads affect and, and behavior and physiology. I also want to note here that when we are thinking about dyadic interactions, they are much more than the sum of their parts. And, and what I mean by that is that you can't simply decompose a dyad into the two individuals that comprise it. So looking at a specific individual's behavior or physiology or affect, that's not necessarily going to tell you anything about the nature, the quality, or the function of that dyad. And rather, the, the dyad in and of itself is its own higher order unit. It has its own patterns, its own features, and its own history that can't be fully explained by any individual member within it. And it's been noted that although um, you know lots of individuals and, and researchers, I think, really do advocate for, for viewing families in this holistic manner or, or thinking about parent-child dyads as systems, but the research in this area is, is still very much used to thinking on an individual level. So it can be really challenging to think about what this, this higher order dyad looks like. So one of the things that can help make it a little bit clearer uh, to think about what it is we're measuring um, here is to look at uh, a few specific measures of dyadic co-regulation or, or dyadic processes. So let's go through a few. So first, dyadic synchrony is something that represents the, the coupling of a dyad across time. And this can be the coupling of emotions or physiology or, or behavior. And it can be measured across a variety of different time scales. So anything from, from milliseconds to days. Dyadic reciprocity is something that represents really the, the give and take between the dyads. So what we're talking about here is the way in which, in which uh, each member of the dyad is attending to or, or responding to the cues that the other member of the dyad is giving. And finally, uh, dyadic dysregulation, that's referring to how well overall the dyad is really modulating their arousal. So evidence of, of dyadic dysregulation, that would look like a dyad that has really intense and, and labile um, emotional swings, um, while dyads with minimal dysregulation would be those that kind of are able to negotiate their collective arousal and, and recover pretty quickly. And it's important to note here that in, in these dyadic processes, both parents and offspring can be the drivers of these processes. So oftentimes, you know, we really think about parents as, as driving these processes because children are so young, but we really do have evidence that children can drive these processes too. So now what I'd like to do is show you a few examples of how we've examined both the antecedents and the consequences of dyadic co-regulation. So what I'm presenting here is a conceptual model that my colleagues and I developed. Uh, we drew upon uh, an amazing longitudinal study of over 300 lower income uh, Mexican origin women who were recruited during pregnancy and followed um, over time into, into childhood. Um, and um, what we're doing here is, is illustrating a model of um, intergenerational transmission of mother's own childhood experiences um, to maternal and child outcomes via a pathway of dyadic functioning. So in this model and in some examples that I'll show you, um, dyadic functioning is really playing a mechanistic role um, linking mom's early experiences to maternal and child outcomes, including child self-regulation. So what this specifically looks like is um, we propose that there are perinatal psychosocial risk factors that can contribute to compromised or poor dyadic functioning. And these risk factors might include things like um, negative life events during pregnancy, um, economic hardship, um, maternal perinatal depressive symptoms, among others. But these perinatal psychosocial risk factors themselves 
have their roots in mother's own childhood childhood experiences of trauma. So mom's own childhood experiences of abuse and neglect and maltreatment among other adversities. Now, when we shift to looking at the, the consequences of um, different indices of dyadic functioning, we propose that dyadic functioning has um, downstream sequelae on maternal and child outcomes, including child self-regulation. So let's get more specific. Let me show you some examples of published published data that supports this conceptual model. So in this first paper, what we're seeing is that the negative life events that mothers experienced when they were pregnant were associated with more dyadic dysregulation at 12 weeks, when infants were 12 weeks old. And this has implications for infant stress physiology. So dyadic dysregulation is associated with greater daily cortisol production among infants, which in turn, is associated with more maternal depressive symptoms. So here, especially in that last point, you're, you're seeing an example of a way in which one facet of children's regulatory abilities may go on to affect mothers. And in a similar model here, we are looking at um, infant cortisol reactivity rather than total cortisol output, but we see the same sort of pattern of relations. So here, again, we see that prenatal negative life events are associated with greater dyadic dysregulation at 12 weeks, which in turn is associated with greater infant cortisol at 12 weeks. And in a second set of analyses, here we focus specifically on child self-regulation as an outcome at 36 and 54 months. Um, we found a similar pathway whereby prenatal risk influenced child self-regulation via dyadic functioning. So this study actually included a measure of dyadic reciprocity. And recall, dyadic reciprocity is referring to that, that give and take or that back and forth between mothers and their infants. And so we're seeing that prenatal risk predicts lower levels of dyadic reciprocity at 12 months. So here, children are a little bit older, but that goes on to persist to 24 months. And this is associated, so greater dyadic reciprocity is associated with higher levels of children's self-regulation at 36 months. And again, that goes on to persist at 54 months. And this full model accounted for about 80% of the variance in children's self-regulation at 54 months. So now let me shift gears slightly and talk a little bit about how all of these findings on dyadic functioning and their, their implications for children's self-regulation may relate to interventions to improve children's development in their, their regulatory capacities. And all of these results are, are really suggesting that interventions need to focus on the dyad. Um, but really, there are not a lot of interventions that have a very strong dyadic focus. Oftentimes, what we see, at least in the, in the United States, is that treatment gets very narrow. It's kind of very focused on either the child or the parent, but not necessarily the dyad as a unit. However, there is one really intervent one intervention that has a really strong dyadic emphasis, and, and this is the intervention that I've been studying in my research. It's called attachment and biobehavioral catch-up, and it was developed several decades ago by Dr. Mary Dozier at the University of Delaware. Uh, this intervention consists of 10 sessions that are typically delivered in families' homes, and it really draws very heavily on uh, the principles of attachment theory and, and neurobiology. The goals of this intervention are to improve parental sensitivity and the dyadic relationship, and also to help regulate children's biobehavioral functioning. And the key mechanism of action, really how this intervention is exerting its, its effects, are through observation of the dyad, not just the parent or the child, but really observation of the dyad. So, as the, the parent and the child are engaging in play, as they're interacting as a dyad, the clinician, the person who is delivering the intervention, is providing what's called in-the-moment feedback to the parent about the things that the parent is doing really well, the types of behaviors that really can help foster a healthy dyadic relationship. And they also get feedback on the things that they can improve upon. So the, the clinician, um, or the person delivering the intervention is providing feedback on 
uh, qualities of the dyad. And there's a very strong empirical base for ABC. There are several large randomized controlled trials showing that it does improve uh, parental sensitivity. It does res improve responsivity between the dyad. And it's also been found to foster um, healthier patterns of diurnal cortisol in children. And so in a, in a recent study that I conducted, I delivered ABC to mothers with heightened depressive symptoms and their toddler aged children with internalizing symptoms. Um, so internalizing symptoms are things like anxiety, withdrawal, emotional reactivity, uh, difficulty separating from the caregiver. And this was a, a small pilot study that was focused on feasibility and preliminary effects. So we enrolled um, a small sample of, of 20 families but I specifically selected a population of mothers with depressive symptoms and, and children with behavior problems because these are dyads that are having difficulties with their own self-regulation and because maternal depression is well known to compromise it, to the dyadic relationship between mothers and their children. And I should note that the pandemic hit about halfway through um, the, the, the study. So about half of the families received ABC in their homes as it's originally designed. Um, and the other half received it by telehealth, but by and large, the, the results I'm presenting here did not differ by modality. So all children exhibited heightened behavior problems um, prior to beginning ABC at that baseline assessment. And we see that immediately after ABC, there were significant declines in both internalizing and externalizing behavior problems among children. Externalizing behavior problems are um, those things like aggression, um, defiance, um, oppositional behaviors. And then we also looked at behaviors three months out. And again, we see that these declines in behavior problems were largely sustained to three months after ABC. So although this is a pretty small sample and the findings are certainly very preliminary. We see an example here of how a very focused uh, dyadic intervention has effects on symptoms that reflect children's behavioral regulatory capacities. So finally, I'd like to wrap up by discuss, discussing some future directions for this work. So uh, one area where I think research is, is very much needed is in the actual measures of dyadic functioning and the experimental paradigms that we're using to assess dyads. So we need paradigms that assess the types of processes that are relevant for, for self-regulation and ones that are appropriate for different developmental stages. Obviously, you know, dyadic interactions are look, going to look very different among, um, you know, parent infant dyads versus parent toddler dyads versus, um, you know, parents and older children. And I think we also need to very much expand our focus beyond mothers. Um, so much of the work on parent child interactions is really mother child interactions and more work on fathers and um, other caregivers is really needed. I would also love to see more work on how we interpret dyadic functioning across varied contexts. So, you know, I think it can be the case that certain types of interactions between parents or and, and children, certain aspects of the, the dyadic relationship, they're not inherently good or bad, but they really depend on the family context in which they unfold. It, it can be the case that certain aspects of dyadic functioning may be adaptive uh, in a particular context um, or have short term benefits, but kind of long term uh, consequences. But there really isn't that much research um, in this area. And finally, I would argue that um, we need more applications of this research and specifically we need more interventions that are dyadically focused. Again, I mentioned in the in the US, the, the nature of the healthcare system is very much that um, the treatment is is siloed to focus on either adults or child. Um, uh, there, there are different um, you know, clinicians that treat adults as adults versus versus children, um, but rarely are our dyads treated despite all of this evidence that we have um, that dyadic functioning is really important um, and that self regulation issues kind of occur um, on, on, a, on the level of the family. And with that, I would like to thank my collaborators and my funders. I really look forward to discussing all of these issues with the other panelists and with the audience members very soon. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. It's time to, it's my pleasure to, to, to introduce now uh, the, our third speaker, Professor Eric Pakulak, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Child and Youth Studies at Stockholm University in Sweden. Uh, his primary research interest is in the development, implementation, and assessment of evidence-based training programs that simultaneously target at least children and their parents. This means two generation programs or approaches, and also the adaptation of these programs for different cultural contexts. Related uh, research interests include uh, also the neuroplasticity of brain systems, important for language and self-regulation, in the context of environments associated with early adversity, including poverty, for example. Eric, please, uh, the room is yours. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Pakulak. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Child and Youth Studies at Stockholm University here in dark and cold Sweden. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Soledad, Nick, and Sebastian for uh, putting together this wonderful symposium with these very important and challenging questions um, and for inviting me to uh, have this opportunity to share my thoughts on these questions. Um, I'd also like to start by um, acknowledging uh, my uh, colleagues in the Brain Development Lab, I've decided to try to answer these questions with some specific examples from our work in my time in the Brain Development Lab, uh, which was at the University of Oregon um, in the United States uh, with more than 30 years of studying neuroplasticity. And it's really important to acknowledge our founding director, uh, Helen Neville, uh, who unfortunately passed away several years ago, but much of the work that I'll use to illustrate some of my thoughts um, is really uh, thanks to her vision. And it's also thanks to, of course, um, our funders, and most importantly, a lot of hard work from really wonderful friends and colleagues in the lab. So of course, nothing I did myself. Um, starting with the first question, um, um, I'd like to frame my answer uh, in terms of an aspect that I think is most relevant to our research and what I'd like to illustrate today. And I think it's just still too common that we see this framing uh, using a deficit framework in which uh, adaptive processes are conceptualized as deficits related to some aspect of poverty or socioeconomic status. Um, and we really had a shift in our work in the conceptualization of the differences that we and others were uh, observing uh, between uh, SES groups. Um, and I also have to really acknowledge Sebastian here because he really informed my and our thinking on this. Um, and so we really shifted our thinking in, in interpreting the results, and I'm going to provide a specific example from characterizing them as vulnerabilities or deficits to actually uh, more adaptive processes, or perhaps uh, more specifically mismatches in, adapt in adaptation between different contexts. Um, so that's really informed our efforts to think a lot more carefully about behavior and brain function in multiple contexts, in, especially in terms of how we um, interpret results from work that we've done and other work um, to really think more about adaptive processes in these contexts. So now to uh, one of my specific examples, and that is our work on uh, one aspect of self-regulation, sustained selective attention, and specifically brain function using event-related potentials. Um, and Courtney Stevens uh, years ago um, was the first to find um, ERP differences in selective attention as a function of socioeconomic status, such that, that there was a difference in this um, modulation of the brain response at 100 milliseconds to stimuli we asked children or adults to attend to compared to stimuli we asked them to uh, suppress or not attend to. Uh, we've replicated this finding work uh, oh, sorry, I forgot. Um, an important point here is that we found that these differences were specific to distractor suppression, such that children from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds did not appear to be suppressing distracting information in the same way as their peers from higher socioeconomic status backgrounds, something that we, again, initially interpreted as a vulnerability, and we've really changed our thinking on that. Um, as I started to say, we've replicated this in uh, 
two independent samples, work of uh, Mandy Hampton Ray, um, as well as Ryan Giuliano. Um, again, showing uh, relationships between socioeconomic status and um, aspects of distractor suppression. Um, so as I said, we used to characterize these results in terms of vulnerable brain systems. And we now think of it differently um, through an uh, adaptation uh, lens. And so we now think of it more as a mismatch in adaptation, such that um, brain function for suppressing distracting information uh, is adaptive in other uh, in different environmental contexts, such as those that might be more chaotic, less consistent, less pre predictable, that generally speaking are, are consistent with um, lower socioeconomic status contexts. Um, and this might reflect, at least in part, um, some increased sensitivity to potential threats in the environment, which of course is perfectly adaptive, um, but perhaps less adapt adaptive in a classroom environment in, in which um, children have an increasing need to suppress distracting information, classmates perhaps around them, um, and sustaining attention for longer periods of time to teachers um, and other relevant stimuli for learning. Um, turning now to question two, sorry, of course, this is so fast, but <laughs> 15 minutes is not a lot of time for very deep and important questions. Um, and my main answer to this would be that I think we really need more holistic approaches. I think there are many good examples of this. So I think that the field generally is really evolving to have more holistic approaches that also consider uh, adaptation specifically uh, in models. Uh, but these approaches that focus on multiple and interacting actually individual and environmental characteristics at multiple levels of analysis. So just some quick examples, uh, sorry, this is so fast, relational developmental systems, is a meta theory, uh, recent models of self-regulation, including an integration of uh, evidence from uh, studies of temperament and executive function, as well as uh, increased focus on the importance of context, culture, and uh, specific goals uh, in the context of executive function. There are neuroimmune network hypothesis. Um, so this increased consideration of these neurobiological factors um, that may contribute to uh, a wide range of longer term health outcomes. And then uh, one of my favorite models, which is the early childhood model of intergen intergenerational poverty by McEwen and McEwen. So a sociologist and a pioneering uh, neurobiologist uh, working together to really uh, try to create this more holistic approach. Um, so now I'm gonna turn back to uh, our work as a specific, um, example hoping to illustrate some of my thoughts um, and in our work we we, we ended up taking a more holistic approach to um, evidence-based interventions that might help children from backgrounds of poverty or lower SF, SES backgrounds um, in which we considered the broader inner in broader environment itself as an intervention target via uh, as specific aspects of parenting and caregiving. So this is a so-called two-generation approach, uh, which involves simultaneously uh, working with parents and children. And so targeting aspects of the environment that might contribute to this putative, putative mismatch in adaptation um, and specifically self-regulation in the context of chronic stress. And so, I'm going to continue with this framing uh, in my answer to question three, uh, given the focus on impact and interventions. So um, in, in, in this approach, uh, again, which involves working simultaneously with uh, parents and children, um, we really attempted to target mechanisms on multiple le levels. It's very important to point out that we, uh, viewed this as an inter interdisciplinary project from the beginning, working closely with educators. Um, and then all of this work is with families from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds. And so um, this idea of targeting at multiple levels and thinking in, in the context of adaptive processes, um, I think what we tried to do is target both aspects of the environment via working with parents, such as consistency and predictability, while simultaneously uh, working with children to try to give them flexible regulatory tools that might support adaptation in uh, different environmental contexts, such as the transition to a more formal schooling environment. 
So this intervention as tested was called Parents and Children Making Connections, Highlighting Attention that involved weekly child training um, with uh, play-based scaffolded uh, activities over eight weeks, uh, called that the brain train, as well as weekly parent training. Um, the classroom strategies uh, involved um, many different strategies. The example I'd like to present here uh, is going back to this idea of mechanisms of attention and potentially mechanisms of adaptation. Um, such that we developed uh, classroom activities, again, scaffolded over time that, that attempted to target these mechanisms specifically. So in this example, um, the child is performing a, 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 a fun activity that requires a great deal of sustained selective attention, that is balancing uh, a little ball and a spoon while walking on a, a wiggly line on, on the floor, while simultaneously suppressing distracting information from her classmates around her. Uh, that's the clip. It's a clip from a video, and I have the, the, the link at the bottom. Uh, we were lucky enough to be a part of a documentary that captured some of this, but um, children were uh, in turn, um, either doing the selective attention activity or acting as distractors around uh, around the children, making as much noise as possible. And so that was that's one example of trying to specifically target these mechanisms. The parent component uh, uh, consisted of eight weekly two-hour meetings in an interactive small group setting. Uh, it's also important to acknowledge our friends and colleagues at the Oregon Social Learning Center. So we adapted a lot of um, this program from their work as well as some unique components and this involves a lot of peer support so parents get a lot from being in a small group with other parents and discussing these things um, and also includes an emphasis on adult modeling of self-regulation via role play um, and so these are strategies that target family stress and child self-regulation uh, just a couple of uh, necessarily quick examples, uh, working with parents to increase their awareness of the development of emotional regulata regulation and how they might help the child develop uh, emotional regulation and other regulatory skills in, in uh, different contexts, including difficult contexts. Providing children with a sense of control and opportunities to make choices and solve problems and have success with their, uh, their developing uh, regulatory skills. And we combine this with what we might call external regulation support in the in, in uh, home schedules in which we work with parents to um, increase the consistency and predictability and provide a bit more structure both for big transitions and big events as well as um, uh, across the the day the daily schedule in an rct study with active and passive controls we found positive support for this intervention across multiple outcome domains, including parent language use, uh, self-rated parenting stress, child social skills and problem behavior, and standardized measures of IQ and language. And then most uniquely and most relevant to the question in terms of assessing impact, we, uh, we specifically assessed the impact on our targeted mechanisms and found that children uh, randomly assigned to receive PCMCA um, improved um, in this measure of brain function at 100 milliseconds. Um, our subsequent work, we have uh, attempted to um, increase our consideration of context and um, develop a model that can be integrated into the preschool context. And so this is our attempt to um, consider the sociocultural level of analysis and testing um, these models in a more authentic context. Um, this was a wonderful project that was a close collaboration with our long-term partners at Head Start in um, in Oregon. So uh, important to collaborate with um, educators. And we also featured, uh, we were able to provide this in English and Spanish because we had previously conducted a rigorous cultural adaptation of this model uh, for Spanish speaking families in our community. Um, this model is called uh, Creating Connections. And the idea here in terms of um, targeting broader environmental context, so trying to think more holistically, uh, is that we decided that in addition to integrating these brain train uh, activities into the classroom environment, we also worked with teachers to have them using the same caregiver strategies in the classroom that we were then subsequently sharing with parents in the parent group. Um, 
with the idea that this would increase the in integration between the classroom and the home environment and provide greater consistency. Uh, we also, to that end, had uh, Head Start teachers uh, co-leading and leading these parent groups as we worked with the parents. Um, and then in terms of the impact, we increased our focus on mechanisms in outcome measures and um, several examples, but one specific example is stress physiology and brain function in both children and adults. Um, outcome analyses of that project are ongoing, but one specific example uh, is Ryan's uh, great work, uh, great dissertation work, um, digging in a bit deeper into uh, mechanisms and specifically autonomic nervous system mechanisms. And what he was able to show was that uh, sympathetic nervous system function mediated the relationship between socioeconomic status and distractor suppression. So uh, some testable hypotheses for, uh, for future work um, and potential for Oh, I am out of time already. Potential for the refinement of interventions. Um, my apologies that this is so quick and over time. Um, I'll just uh, finish up in a few minutes here. Um, these are really, really important but challenging questions, especially for 15 minutes. Um, so what I decided to do was basically think of this in terms of uh, implications, challenges, and future directions, and sticking with this this broader theme of more holistic approaches now i realize that this is much easier said than done and all of these bullet points are very very resource and time intensive and and difficult but at the same time i would argue important um, first would be interdisciplinary collaborations so between educators as i've noted in our work sociologists policy makers economists we also did some collaborations with economists um, considering multiple levels of analysis and moving towards longitudinal designs. Um, so a more specific consideration of individual differences in, uh, at a mechanistic level in adaptive processes and um, how that might confer what might be considered resilience in some contexts. Um, as I said, mechanisms of adaptation. So uh, consideration of long-term implications of early adaptive processes. So allostatic load and relationships, for example, with sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic nervous system um, function early in development. Um, and then the development and assessment of more holistic intervention approaches, um, which again is certainly the approach that, that we took, and it's these are all testable hypotheses, but uh, we think it's a potentially uh, promising direction. Um, and then I think most importantly, and what I would like to end with is the increased an increased consideration of context and culture. Um, I think that's just vitally important, uh, both context within culture, uh, so the work of Sebastian and Soledad and colleagues in Argentina, for example, just looking at some of these questions as a function of rural versus urban context provides a lot of important insight. Um, and then uh, something I'm very interested in, uh, what do these adaptive processes look like in non-weird samples? Of course, most of the research that I've discussed and the research that we conducted were uh, essentially in what we would call a, a, a weird setting. And so um, can we identify universal processes across different cultural contexts, such as the adaptation of regulatory process with increased sensitivity to threat, um, and then use this information in informative ways. So via the cultural adaptation and or specificity of, of intervention approaches in these different contexts. Um, <clears throat> I'm a bit over time, I apologize, but I think it's just very exciting to think of the future because we just have so much to learn um, about all of these processes. So I really look forward to a discussion in this symposium and future research. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Eric, for this very nice and thought-provoking talk. Um, so I'm very happy to introduce our fir uh, fourth speaker today, uh, Professor Dima Amso. Dima is a professor of psychology in the Department of Psychology at Columbia University. She is the director of the Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience Lab and of the Virtual Lab for Science Innovation and Community Engagement. 
Her um, outstanding research program investigates the development of attention, executive functions, and memory, with an emphasis on how environmental variables shape these trajectories. She has authored over 80 papers on these topics. Her research program is very well funded, and um, Dima is a recipient of the James McDowell Donnell um, Scholar Award and is an elected fellow at the, the American Psychological Society. Hi, everybody. Thanks to the organizers for having me and giving me an opportunity to speak at this important symposium. Let me start by saying that uh, the work that I'm going to talk about to answer the questions is um, work that's been done in particular with Denise Worshen at NYU, with David Better and Michael Frank at Brown, and with Gaia Sheriff at Oxford. So thanks to them right from the beginning. The first question that we were asked to address is, are adaptive mechanisms conceptualized and evaluated in the study of self-regulatory processes from contemporary developmental sciences? Spread a mouthful. Uh, so let me start by offering a definition of self-regulation. And then talking a little bit about the mechanisms for self-regulation that might be relevant to addressing this question. Together, these two uh, bullet points really in this short talk will form the basis of my response to this question. So self-regulation here is defined as adjusting, ruling, or governing emotion or behavior without outside interference. So by definition, regulating yourself, regulating your behavior, regulating your actions, your emotions is, is something that has to be learned or is contextualized and the rules that govern it must be learned. Let me explain what I mean by that. So what I mean by that is in a classic task that's been used to study um, control over, say, actions, uh, this is a form of a, of a card sorting task. This is a, a developmentally appropriate dimensional change card sorting task, the child is to um, use a particular rule to make a response. So in this case, the rule is the color rule on the left. And if they're given a card that's blue, they're asked to sort it in the blue pile and red, they're asked to sort it in the red pile. So a properly regulated or in control um, child will take the blue card and put it in the blue pile and the red card and put it in the red pile. But then, and they're, and they're, they're really holding in working memory the high level rule, shape game, color game. It has nothing to do with the concrete features of the rabbit and the boat. It's about the color. Now, they can then be asked to switch and learn a different rule. And when they're asked to learn a different rule, they might play the shape game. And now they have to sort the rabbit with the rabbits regardless of its color and the boat with the boats regardless of its color. So now, same cards, different rule held in, work, in, mem in working memory, and the response is completely different. So the context governs what the response looks like. And the context is not something that one shows up and learns. Contexts are largely social. Um, I might answer the phone in my own office, but I certainly, that response to pick up a phone that rings in my colleague's office would be completely or regulation of my own behavior. And so the ability to switch and update novel rules into working memory um, when in a novel context is really the flexibility that's required for self-regulation. To understand adaptive mechanisms relevant to self-regulation, we have to start with the who's. Who's adapting and the how's? What are the mechanisms of adaptation that we're talking about? And so to do that, I want to sort of introduce the idea that it really matters who's doing the adapting because it'll define what you see as adaptive behavior. So what is self-regulation relevant to an adult? Well, an adult has to um, plan their day, might have high level values and goals for raising their children in which they plan their behavior when they're interacting with their child in accord with those. But a child doesn't do that. Their self-regulation might be emotionally regulating with peers when they get negative feedback 
or thinking through how to do a math problem in school. And infants also have self-regulation. This idea that these skills develop late is, con in, in my view, um, is, is a, not quite the way that we should be thinking about it. Infants learn so much information and they're constantly learning how to, how to flexibly apply rule structures relevant to things like wanting to receive positive feedback. And so they might learn how to behave with a particular caregiver um, in order to get that feedback. And they might learn the rules of language. Um, and so for me, the they're self-regulation computation, holding something in working memory and acting flexibly when those working memory rules change, when the, when the context changes, excuse me, that's self-regulation. How precisely an organism or a child or an infant or an adult regulates their behavior, it depends on a million different variables that have to do with their own circumstances, their own environments or niches that they live in. So really self-regulation, of course, is considered to have some sort of protracted developmental course because it's in fact a challenge for the inexperienced learner. So to contextualize this a little bit more, um, how do you learn the concepts or the categories or the rules for behavior or emotions that you've never encountered or experienced before? And Denise Worshan in my uh, in my lab, and now she's um, she's at NYU doing amazing things, has really spent a lot of time working on this problem in infancy. So, for instance, when a child learns even a very simple rule for something like when you're at home, you should use your inside voice. That is a rule of behavior that a child could be regulated properly or not regulated properly if they were to apply this rule. Um, so you know that when you're, 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 the rule is the context, which is the home environment, regulates whether you should use your inside voice or, or not. And so then how does an infant or, or a very young child infer what they should do when they encounter things they've never experienced before? So they might learn this rule at home and they might be fantastic at it, but then what if they go to grandma's house? And what if they go to the library? Will they be able to take that context, indoor context, regulate voice frequency to, an, to grandma's house and to the library, which share something similar contextually? And that generalization from one context to another and applying rules is really the hallmark of cognitive flexibility. So when we started working on this problem, we really used a particular um, computational paper to guide the way that we were thinking about it. And the infant work was also done with um, Michael Frank, and, who's at Brown, and Ann Collins, who's now at Berkeley. Um, so just to, to stick with the prefrontal cortex and flexible cognitive control rules without symbols paper. Um, there is indeed a long history of looking at the prefrontal cortex when studying self-regulation or cognitive control um, or executive functions. These are all labels that are used for a very similar construct. And the idea is that you don't just look at the prefrontal cortex, you look at its full connectivity with the rest of the brain. But what they did is, is, is effectively what I just showed you. They tested the effects of models um, that tried to uh, sort of conceptualize how abstract knowledge structures were being built for self-regulation. And they had models with PFC and models without PFC. They also trained models on tasks across either two or three learning contexts. So I won't get into their learning contexts, but in vision, they trained the models on tasks that only had your own home and grandma's house and models on tasks that had the rule being same rule being implemented in your home, grandma's house and the library. And what they found is that variability in context, that is three versus two learning contexts, in which to implement the same rule structure, so using the indoor voice or being able to shout, um, is the key to generalization. And it absolutely required prefrontal cortex computations of working memory and cognitive flexibility. So specifically, going into a novel context, updating the rule into working memory, and then acting on it, and then flexibly switching when the higher level context changes, required multiple different instantiations of the whatever the appropriate rule is. I've been using the indoor-outdoor voice. Imagine red means stop, green means go. That's another rule that people are, you know, um, for example, quite familiar with. When they train the model on two or three 
two versus three learning contexts, it really was the variability in which to implement that rule that supported abstracting a knowledge structure that allowed for generalization rather than having to learn the concrete rule for self-regulation separately in each context. And we made, you know, we've spilled a lot of ink studying precisely how these mechanisms of updating rules into working memory and then flexibly switching when the context has changed um, in infancy and in childhood and, and even in adulthood. And we find that you can do this in multiple ways. You could give the rule to the individual. That's classically the way that people have studied this in, in middle childhood and adulthood. Or you could look at how rules can be abstracted through spontaneous learning in early infancy and then applied um, in a generalizable kind of way. And so we've done both. And I, and I don't want to you know, belabor this point, but I want to come back to answering the second part of the question. This is the paper that Denise Roshan and I put out in 2017 in Psych Review, where we put some ideas out there to answer this question. We called it the ecological account of prefrontal cortex functional development. We argued first that prefrontal cortex performs the same basic computations across the lifespan. This is important because in our, from the data that we have in infants, it's not clear to us that there is a protracted developmental course at all to prefrontal cortex, but that rather it's performing very similar computations, meaning that it has an architecture, it has a structure and its connectivity to the rest of the brain. When taken into account, let us to propose the idea that it's performing these updating working memory updating and switching computations across the lifespan. But the input that it's working on is what's changing. So the visual system changes, the auditory system changes early in postnatal life. That information is being fed forward into the prefrontal cortex. And prefrontal cortex is computing over these inputs that are all rapidly changing. The body is changing. The baby is able to go from being a sitter to being a crawler to being a walker. The information sampling is changing dramatically, which changes the nature of the computations and challenges the prefrontal cortex to adapt to increasingly different demands that the organism is experiencing as it fundamentally changes. So that's what we mean by their unique ecological niche. A baby lives in a different niche and constructs a different niche. Every single time eye movements become more efficient or they go from crawling to walking or they start to sample different aspects of their tactile or sensory, even their taste buds change or their ability to eat solid foods, excuse me, changes. All of that is increasing demand on the prefrontal cortex to continually adapt its basic computations to more and more sort of complex inputs. And to be clear, when we talk about environment, the prefrontal cortex, and I'll say this again, the prefrontal cortex's environment is not the world. It is the rest of the brain. It is not connected to any sensory registers. We argued that its functional development will be reciprocally influenced by adaptation to changes in the input to the prefrontal cortex via feed forward connections, which I just talked about this idea of information sampling. And I'll show you what I mean by feed forward connections, as well as through niche construction. So via PFC's feedback connections to other neural regions. So our argument became in this paper that as the world is changing for the infant and as the infant's body is changing, what's happening is that they're constructing more and more of their environment, certainly, but that, and, and this idea of constructivism, I think is something that we can discuss in person, but, um, so then the next question is, how are these knowledge and methods articulated specifically to the study of poverty? I wanted to start that with this idea of Bronfenbrenner because truthfully, what is poverty? Poverty is certainly a lack of money. Maybe it's a track lack of nutrition. Maybe it's a lack of resources, but is it a lack of experiences that might shape those computations that I said were adapting to the novel inputs and shaping the environment of the child? So, so it's clearly not a lack of social relationships necessarily or access to church and community, um, you know, out here in the in the meso system. Um, opportunity to navigate and survive unsafe spaces is certainly something that happens in poverty. So experiences that are shaping the child are as abundant in poverty as they are in wealth the kinds of experiences the prefrontal cortex needs to adapt its computations are present. 
which are, again, those computations of working memory and flexibility. So to say that a child living in poverty or say in an unsafe uh, urban community has to has less um, need for self-regulation or executive functions or has less need for the, the um, pathways in the prefrontal cortex to learn knowledge and rule structures and then adapt them to novel circumstances seems to me a bit of a bizarre assumption. Um, so certainly poverty is not good. Poverty is bad, but children's developmental change in response to experiences that are common in poverty is neither bad nor good. But in fact, our, if this child is doing well, are adapted, there may be an argument that poverty, toxic exposure, nutrition has an impact on the brain and the body that's widespread. Whether it's relevant to adaptation of self-regulation is, is, I think, a completely different question. So what implications, challenges, and future directions would these approaches imply for scientific research in the field? This is a great question. And frankly, I think there are um, there's a tendency in 2021, almost 2022, for scientists to prescribe um, how science should be done or what have you. And I know that's not what this question is. But let me just say up front, there are a million different ways to study self-regulation, all of which are valuable, and a million different um, insights that are offered by different methodologies, different sample sizes, different approaches, computational, behavioral, et cetera. And so I want to say that what we need is to really apply everything that we possibly can to understanding how the system is emerging from its environment. And, and most importantly, is to really capture the lived experience of children and families. And this goes back to Brown Food Burner. We, I think, need to stop doing things like define poverty as living below an income source, but not really understanding all of the possible influences. First, there's a human dignity associated with that. So it's, it's to me, a respectful, if you're going to do this kind of work, to try to understand how people live. And most of the people doing the work really don't have any experience with poverty. So that insight is critical to doing good work. And secondly, if this is the kind of work that we're talking about, I think a challenge in a future direction is to really become less siloed as developmental scientists. You need to become a sociologist. You need to become a political scientist, possibly an economist. You need to step out of the zone and become a scholar of the broader community of the influences. And with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you very much, Dima, for your presentation. Well, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our first discussant, Dr. Robin Naslak. Well, he's an associate professor of psychology at Northwestern University, where he also holds appointments in neurobiology, psychiatry, and medical social sciences. He is director of the Affective and Clinical Neuroscience Laboratory at Northwestern University, where he also serves as director of the Cell Society, Center on Social Disparities and Health. His research examines how the brain creates emotion and which brain systems are disrupted in disorders of emotions, including anxiety, depression, and mania. Dr. Naslak has published over 80 journal articles and book chapters and has received a number of honors and awards for his research, including the Rising Star Award from the Association for Psychological Science. His research on the neuroscience of mental health and emotional well-being has been featured in both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Naslak wasn't able to attend today, but he shared his comments and thoughts in the following video. I'd uh, really like to thank Soledad and Nicholas and Sebastian for inviting me to participate in this really exciting symposium on challenges in the evaluation of adaptation processes in the study of self-regulation. My name is Robin Nusslock and I'm an Associate Professor of Psychology at Northwestern University where I run a laboratory using functional and structural brain imaging to examine both emotion generation and emotion regulation in the brain. 
Um, and so this symposium really aligns with a lot of my own interests professionally uh, in the work that we do in my lab. Um, and I'm really excited to be a discussant for this symposium and to have the opportunity to uh, explore and um, converse with the ideas put forth by Daniel Rubinov, Eric Pakalak, Mar uh, Mariah De Joseph, and Dima uh, Amso. Um, and really do my best to highlight what I consider some cross-cutting themes of these particular talks. So the first theme that really was mentioned by all four of the speakers uh, was the importance of context uh, in understanding self-regulation. That is moving away from a kind of per, you know, in, internalized view of self-regulation, recognizing that self-regulation is by nature contextual. It happens in certain contexts, and it's important to understand contextual dynamics when we're understanding self-regulation. And I think Dima Amsa really did a nice job of laying the foundation for this, mentioning that the ability to learn self-regulatory strategies and update and switch based on context is very important. So it's this ability to engage in appropriate regulatory behaviors in a particular context, and what is appropriate in one context may not be the appropriate uh, regulatory uh, process or behavior in another context. Um, furthermore, she mentions that we learn these knowledge structures that allow for generalizations rather than having to learn a separate rule for each situation. And I think it's really these knowledge structures that are interesting to examine mechanistically and then how those knowledge structures translate to a variety of different um, uh, situations in different contexts. Then Daniel Rubinoff did a really nice job, uh, I, I thought, of highlighting the need to move beyond hyper-individualized models of self-regulation um, and really introducing this idea of dyads and dyadic reciprocity um, and exploring, uh, you know, this in the context of a parent-child dynamic, but it really could be uh, applied to many other types of relationships. And I think this has a lot of relevance for new methods in neuroscience and prospering correlations and techniques that could be examined, used to examine this particular topic. And I thought this was a very important kind of extension of self-regulation. Um, Maria De Joseph in her uh, Pakalak really uh, then continued this conversation and I think took it to a broader level and, set and, and highlighted the importance of having a sociocultural perspective. So if, if regulation is really contextual, it's important to place that into a sociocultural perspective and understand that certain regulatory processes may be optimal in one culture or less optimal in another. We really need to take this such a sociocultural perspective and I thought that was very uh, interesting and important. Um, and then um, Maria De Joseph really then, I think, pushed the envelope in an important way and said, well, if we're going to do cross-cultural research in the context of self-regulation, we need to develop analytic methods and analytic approaches uh, for, for addressing this. And she uh, proposed some very interesting methods uh, to address method invariance um, that I think we need to take very seriously in, in this work. Uh, a second theme that really permeated uh, the symposium was uh, the need to move from a deficit model to an adaptation perspective. So to move, to, to move beyond um, just viewing uh, self-regulation as being good or bad to a more integrated adaptation perspective. I really liked Eric's uh, comment on this, this idea of a mismatch adaptation so that somebody may have learned an adaptation a self-regulatory process in one particular environment, and that may be mismatched with the environment with which they find it, found themselves in, but it may be really optimal for the initial environment with which that self-regulatory process developed. And he presented some very nice data on this using ERPs, in which he suggests that, you know, a difficulty suppressing uh, information may be actually very adaptive in certain contexts, maybe even in poverty or threatened situations in which it takes more vigilance to navigate and survive, but then that may be less adaptive or mismatched in an educational environment. It also makes me think of Seth Pollock's work in which he uh, did an earlier study some years ago in which he exposed individuals who were exposed to early adversity, um, in this case abuse, versus those who weren't. And then he showed them a morphing paradigm in which uh, the images here go from very pixelated to non-pixelated. And the participants were instructed to basically indicate 
when they could tell the facial expression and what emotion it was, you can see that amongst happy faces, individuals with and without a history of abuse were basically comparable on their uh, performance, but individuals who grew up in adversity actually were faster in uh, de detecting the correct facial expression when that facial expression was anger, um, suggesting that that might have been an adaptive emotional uh, propensity or adaptive perpetual per uh, perceptual propensity uh, for those children. And so optimal from an early developmental perspective, but may be associated with risk for mental and physical health problems down the road. Um, and this, I think this need for a socio, uh, of, of moving from a deficit to an adaptation perspective is really relevant for understanding uh, the, the literature on self-regulation and poverty and adversity. So we're not pathologizing um, variability in self-regulation in certain contexts, but seeing that it may be very adaptive in those particular settings. Another theme that emerged was the idea of mechanisms. And so uh, what are the mechanisms of, of self-regulation? Um, and self-regulation is really an umbrella term that involves a suite of, of partially related processes. And there may be different components or different mechanics that mediate these different processes. And so uh, these, the mechanisms of self-regulation may not be a homogenous thing. There may be different mechanisms underlying different suites or different components of self-regulation. Um, and there's a long history, as Dima Alonso really talked about, of the prefrontal cortex as being important in self-regulation and cognitive control. But she makes, I think, a very important point that we really need to look outside of the prefrontal cortex and look at the connectivity with the prefrontal of, of the prefrontal cortex with other brain regions um, and appreciate that you know, self-regulation is really a whole brain phenomenon as opposed to just being grounded in the prefrontal cortex. Um, this also, I think, raises an interesting conversation between the difference between bottom-up and top-down processes. Um, and I think this makes me think of Nid and Tom and Tottenham's work, uh, suggesting that the subcortex is actually a teacher of the cortex um, over developmental processes and developmental time, so that uh, the amygdala plays an important role in informing the cortex. So instead of it's just thinking about the cortex as the kind of primary developer of self-regulation, you really need to take a whole brain perspective. Um, and this also raises the idea of volitional versus non-volitional regulation. I personally think a lot of self-regulation is pre-conscious and it's happening outside of the context of volitional processes and more ventral portions of the prefrontal cortex um, and even in kind of their communication with the subcortex. And so what's the difference between volitional versus non-volitional regulation, I think is an interesting topic. It highlights the need for also more integrative multi-systems models from my perspective to plug my own work for just a second. Um, my colleague Greg Miller and I have been very interested in a multi-organ perspective of self-regulation and in particular looking at the relationship between the brain and the immune system and how adversity can affect these neuroimmune pathways in a way that really generates risk for a host or a suite of mental and physical health problems. Um, and in, relevant to this is not only understanding the brain and the immune system, but also understanding the bidirectional feedback between the body and the behavioral uh, choices that a person makes. And that those behaviors, particularly in the context of addictive behaviors, can come back and affect the brain and affect its regulatory capacity. So I would argue that the mechanistic uh, kind of scope of self-regulation not only expand outside of the prefrontal cortex, but actually expand into a whole kind of body perspective and placing that body in the context with which it finds itself. Um, if we're going to study mechanisms, we need to, to try to unpack causality. And I think Maria did a really nice job of, of putting forth some, um, some analytic techniques that we should be very aware of as we think about uh, moving forward and unpacking causality. It also highlights the need of combining across multiple levels of analysis. So from psychology to biology, and even within biology, there's multiple different modalities. There's different methods of neuroimaging, there's peripheral physiology, there's psychophysiology, functional genomics. Um, and I would suggest that this highlights the importance of interdisciplinary collaborations. Uh, we can't be masters of all of these different techniques. And it's really you know, a unique opportunity to create interdisciplinary teams. On that point, I'd just like to plug a uh, workshop that we're running at Northwestern this summer called the Summer Institute on Biological Approaches in Social Sciences, which is actually meant to bring uh, senior graduate students, postdocs, or junior assistant professors 
to Northwestern to really get training for a period of time on interdisciplinary biological approaches. So Greg Miller will discuss immunology, Tom McDade will discuss um, immunology as well, and Adam will discuss uh, cortisol, Edith Chen uh, will discuss kind of peripheral physiology and its relationships to the brain, Chris Kazawa and others will be involved in this. Um, and I'd encourage you to apply if you'd be interested in attending this workshop as a way of kind of establishing these collaborations. Another perspective that really uh, came out in the talks was the need for a developmental perspective. Uh, uh, Dima Amso really did a nice job of highlighting this. Um, and I just want to mention briefly a study by Dylan G that I think really raises for me an important perspective on development, which is the idea that a particular developmental profile at one point in development may be optimal, but, but it also may be maladaptive at another point. So she did a study in which she looked at functional connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. The normative profiles is that children typically show a positive relationship between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala because kind of, you know, everything is amplifying each other uh, in, in a child's brain. But as a person moves to adolescence, they become better at actually using the prefrontal cortex to attenuate subcortical reward processing as a part of the instantiation of self-regulation. However if, you, however, if you look at children who are growing up in a really adverse situation, these are children who are growing up in a Romanian orphanage, orphanage uh, in which there was a lot of adversity, um, you actually see that the children go through an accelerated uh, process, uh, accelerated developmental trajectory of prefrontal to subcortical regulation. They actually become super good at regulating their emotions, but they do it too earlier. Uh, and this actually, this, this trajectory of doing this too early predicted later problems over the course of their lifespan. So I don't think it's just an idea of something's bad or good. It depends on kind of what the developmental arc with which that profile is occurring. And Daniel Rubinoff did a really nice job of also highlighting the need for a developmental perspective in these dyadic reciprocity paradigms and ideas. Um, and just highlighting the importance of the parent regulating the child, but also she mentions, she mentions the importance of the, the child regulating the parent. Um, Maria did a, you know, had a nice conversation on the need for a developmental perspective and really taking into consideration the importance of analytic techniques that can establish causality, but then do so across multiple levels of analysis. Um, another theme that emerged was the importance of translating this basic work on self-regulation into prevention and intervention programs. We saw two wonderful examples of this uh, with Eric Papalik's uh, research uh, on the parents and children making connections and highlighting attention program. Um, this does a nice job of emphasizing both bottom-up and top-down training, um, multi-generation interventions. And it just brings to mind Jean Brody's work on this at the University of Georgia, which I think also has a lot of relevance to these self-regulatory strategies. And then Danielle Rubinoff did, uh, you know, discussed her wonderful research on attachment and biobehavioral catch-up program, the ABC and maternal depressive, or the ABC paradigm, looking at its relationship with depression, and really highlights the value of dyad-based interventions. Um, and how instead of just focusing on the individual, we really should take more of a systems perspective and in interventions. Um, I would like to uh, just kind of plug uh, one idea that I think is relevant to this conversation is not only looking at kind of what can go wrong in uh, self-regulation, but also looking at points of protection or resiliency. Um, this is a study that we did in which, which we looked at network connectivity in the prefrontal cortex, actually the central executive network, uh, which is anchored in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and portions of the parietal cortex. And we looked at this as a moderator of children's exposure to neighborhood violence. So this is a heat map of all of the murders that happened for the five years prior to the MRI scan. Um, participants also then had blood drawn and had assessments of cardiometabolic health. Um, the blue colors here represent kind of normative rates of murder in the country. Uh, in Chicago, we have a lot of variability, such that we have also higher uh, rates of murder, uh, as you can see. So there is variability in this particular sample. Each black dot is a participant in the study. So we were able to get data at the block level uh, of analysis um, from the FBI for the five years prior to the MRI scan. And what we did is we examined the extent to which this network connectivity in the central executive network helped protect children from the cardiometabolic consequences of living in neighborhood violence. 
Um, so this just shows you the central executive network. We split people up into high resting state versus low resting state functional connectivity in the uh, central executive network. And what you can see here is just that if a person's living in a low neighborhood, uh, low murder neighborhood, a neighborhood characterized by low violence, you see no relationship between the central executive network and in this case, insulin resistance, which is a marker of cardiometabolic risk. Um, however, if a person is living in a high neighborhood environment, the central executive network really moderates this such that if there's high central executive network connectivity, the person is really protected from the negative consequences of living in an adverse environment. By contrast, if there's lower central executive network connectivity, the person has higher insulin resistance um, and greater risk for cardiometabolic health conditions. And we see this across multiple metrics, again, suggesting that regulatory strength as measured by the central executive network can actually become a resilience profile to help protect children from the negative effects of living in an adverse environment. And this adjusted for age, sex, racial and ethnic identity, and puberal status. I just want to finish with uh, two points. One is a point raised by Maria. Um, just again, the need to take a uh, the, the, the perspective of the people we're studying and really engage in the next generation of researchers and also engage with participants in our study in a way that really honors their stories, honors their experiences, um, and really incorporates more of a conversation. And I think learning from them as much as we're uh, maybe learning, you know, teaching them or what have you. So I think this was a really uh, nice point and I commend Maria for implementing this program at um, University of Minnesota. And as a resiliency researcher, you know, I always kind of struggle with the fact that, you know, here we're looking at profiles in the brain to help protect people from adversity. But as Muna Abdi says, instead of praising people for being resilient, we should change the systems that are making people uh, vulnerable. And so I think this just highlights for me that in addition to focusing on self-regulation, it's also a moral imperative at this point in time to also focus on adjusting the structural systems that are generating adversity and poverty um, and forcing people to engage in these profiles of resiliency. So with that, I just again want to thank uh, the organizers of the symposium for inviting me to be a discussant. Thank the wonderful speakers for their really thought-provoking talk. Please email me or contact me if, any, uh, if you have any questions about my comments. I'm sorry I won't be able to attend uh, the in-live conversation on Monday. I, I have a prior commitment, but I'll be there in spirit. And uh, thank you for, again, including me in this conversation. We appreciate uh, very much Robin uh, presentation. Uh, undoubtedly, we'll, we'll feed the, the Q&A section. Now it's time to present our last speaker, the discussion, the Professor Willem Tronkehaus, uh, who obtained his degrees in psychology and philosophy at the University of Amsterdam and his PhD in biological anthropology at the University of California in LA, Los Angeles. He then was a postdoctoral researcher at the Cognitive Development Center of the Central European University in Budapest. And between 2012 and 2020, he was assistant and associate professor of the Department of, Develop uh, of Developmental Psychology at the Behavioral Science Institute at Radboud University in Netherlands. Since September 2020, he has been an associate professor of psychology at Utrecht University, also in Netherlands and uh, a senior researcher of the Max Planck Institute for Research on Crime, Security and Law in Freiburg, Germany. Will, uh, Willem, uh, Willem, thank you very much for being, being here. And please, uh, now is your, the room is yours and it's your time to close the, the symposium. Hello, everybody. My discussion focuses on two themes that ran across all four talks. And the first one is integration within psychology. And the second one is integration of psychology with other disciplines. Now, traditionally, the focus has been on the ways in which chronic adversity may produce chronic stress, which in turn may produce impairments in aspects of cognitive functioning, including self-regulation. But recently, people are very interested in broadening this view to incorporate adaptive processes. Now, we can ask at least three questions about this broadening. So first of all, what should this broader focus look like? Secondly, how should this broader focus bridge with other fields? 
And then thirdly, what are the practical implications of this broader view? And I won't have time to discuss those in detail. And so in the talks, I saw at least four ways in which the current views are broadening. And the first one is to incorporate hidden talents. The second one, reasonable responses. The third one, more thinking about structures and systems. And the fourth one, better representation. And so hidden talents are abilities that are enhanced by adversity. For instance, if someone grows up in a threatening environment, aspects of their perception of danger might be enhanced. Or if people grow up in rapidly changing environment, aspects of their cognition for perceiving and updating uh, changes in the environment could be enhanced. Now, in 2013, I wrote an article that kind of outlined a framework for studying these hidden talents. And the first question in this framework is, what challenges do people face in a given environment? So for instance, the challenges associated with neglect are obviously different than the challenges associated with threat, even if these two things are correlated to some extent at the population level. The second question is what mental skills might people develop for dealing with the particular type or types of adversity that they encounter in their environment? Thirdly, how can we measure these abilities? Can we use existing tasks or do we need to design new ones? And then fourthly, you know, once we discover some of these abilities that are enhanced, how can this knowledge be leveraged in productive ways to, you know, to help individuals, for example, in education or employment? So a second way in which the current view can be broadened is by incorporating reasonable responses. And these are not necessarily skills, they are just responses that can be understood in light of the costs and benefits that a particular context provides. And so, for example, if you grow up in a chaotic environment where there are unpredictable threats, maybe filtering information at a later stage you know, is, is intelligent, is smart, is reasonable in light of the costs and benefits. Because if you filter too early, you might miss out on things that actually are pretty relevant for you. Another potential reasonable response is the fact that people who tend to grow up in harsh and unpredictable environments tend to be more likely to focus sort of on immediate rewards, on the here and now, on, on their immediate needs. Obviously, those are very crucial if you grow up in such an environment. Um, and so seeing you know, those kinds of responses to the current context, focusing you know, on, on the here and now and on immediate, uh, solving immediate problems um, is, is very reasonable and very understandable um, if you understand very well the context in which people are making these decisions. OK, I work together with an organization called Young in Prison, and we were doing a session with some youth and some social workers and justice professionals. And I gave them the classical dilemma of would you like 10 euros now or 20 euros um, you know, next week. And, um, you know, many of the youth went to one side and basically all of the justice professionals and social workers to the other side. They wanted to wait. The youth preferred to have the, uh, the money now. That's kind of what you would predict. But what was more interesting is that when I asked the youth, you know, why would you like the money now? They said, look, you know, I don't know if I can trust you. I don't know if you'll come next week, even if you would come. And even if you want to pay me back next week, I don't know if you have the money next week. Another said, actually, I need, I, I, maybe I trust you, but I need the money now. I need the money today. So it's very rational from their perspective to choose that option. And it might be much better to see that as an adaptive response in their context rather than, you know, um, a failure of self-control, for instance. The social workers and the justice professionals chose the 20 euros next week. And when I asked them why, they said, well, I have no reason not to trust you. In other words, my prior is that people can be trusted. The third way of broadening is to think more about systems and structures and interactions, okay? And so Danielle very nicely described the dyad as the mother infant or the caregiver infant dyad and how that should be understood as a system. And that dyad is of course nested within other systems, maybe you know a larger family, a neighborhood, a country. And so modeling you know, people and their interactions in a more dynamic way and taking into account the systems and the structures that either provide affordances or that limit you know, their options, their decisions, um, is going to be critical and should be done more than psychology is doing today. Now, the fourth one of broadening is representation. Now, representation is very important uh, uh, in, in at least two ways, in more than two ways, but I can highlight two. And one is in the study populations that we include. And by representing, you know, I don't only mean 
you know, and this was very nicely outlined, I think, in Dima's talk, it's not just that the participants are diverse, but also that we take very seriously their lived experiences and try to understand how they perceive the world, how they see their decisions. And it's sometimes very difficult when you have grown up in a different context, perhaps, to really understand why people are doing what they're doing if you don't get people involved in this kind of deeper way where you try to really understand their lived experiences. But it's not only about the participants. As Mariah pointed out, it's also about the scientists. And so currently, many scientists come from relatively stable, supportive backgrounds. Not all of them. Fortunately, there is, of course, some variation, but there's an overrepresentation of particular groups and underrepresentation of other groups. And it's very important for science to incorporate people from very diverse backgrounds for many reasons, including the reasons that people who themselves may have come from less safe and less stable backgrounds or people who have maybe not you know navigated the challenges associated with going to college those are different you know different challenges but you know people who have experience with these different types of you know exposures or, or, or challenges um, of course have a lot to offer in terms of understanding the constraints and the systems and the challenges uh, that are associated with this so I focused so far on integration within psychology. And now I'll talk about bridging across disciplines. So when we talk about bridging, I want to focus on four disciplines for now, anthropology, biology, sociology, and history. Now, anthropology has a ton to offer to psychology, really, but I, I'll focus just on lived experience. Anthropologists have studied since, it's, since the field's inception, you know, how can we really understand the way that people perceive their world, experience their world, conceptualize the costs and benefits or, you know, the reasons for what they are doing. Um, and so anthropologists have a lot of expertise about how do I become part of a community? How do I really listen to people? How do I, you know, give them the space to tell me something about their lives rather than, you know, me asking them about their lives in a sort of uh, um, asymmetric way. And so psychology can learn a ton from anthropology about lived experience and obviously also about cultural diversity and many other things anthropologists are interested in. In terms of biology, you know, uh, psychologists can learn a lot about adaptation. Okay, so the notion of adaptation in biology is about fitness, survival, and reproduction. In, in psychology, it's sometimes about that, but sometimes it's about, for example, um, you know, behavior that is conducive to well being or that's socially desirable. And that focus is equally valid, but it is quite different because it could be the case that a child who's hypervigilant in a dangerous environment is doing a biologically adaptive behavior that's actually detrimental to the child's current well being. So, notions of adaptations sometimes differ between biology and psychology, but they are, you know, they, there are also, of course, psychologists interested in, in, in kind of the evolutionary perspective. But in addition to that, biologists have very sophisticated ways of studying adaptation, where rather than sort of intuiting that, oh, in this kind of environment, maybe this kind of behavior is adaptive, they formalize these types of hypotheses and they build the environment in a sort of statistical way. And then they evolve the strategy or they develop the strategy to see what kind of strategy actually would be adaptive. And sometimes the results of those things are actually quite different from what psychologists claim would be adaptive from an evolutionary perspective in those conditions. Now, thirdly, sociology. Sociology has studied, you know, also since its inception, the way that sort of, you know, structures and systems interact are nested within each other, institutions and how they constrain and shape and influence and afford particular decisions. So if we're interested in incorporating this in psychology, let's build bridges with sociology as well. Finally, history. So a ton is known about the kinds of adversities that people have experienced over evolutionary time. It's also true that a ton is not known, but it's, it's also true that we do know a lot about the kinds of morbidity and mortality and specific adversities that, that humans at different ages have experienced across human history. And this is sometimes called, you know, the expected childhood. So there are implicit and explicit assumptions in psychology about which kinds of childhoods the human species has evolved to deal with. And some of the ideas that people have about which forms of self-regulation are adaptive or maladaptive are based on the idea that maybe the kind of experiences that this child has been exposed to fall outside of the species typical range, meaning the range that humans have evolved to adapt to. And for that reason, you know, we see a maladaptive response in self-regulation. Maybe 
But actually, it's an empirical question which adversities humans have been exposed to across evolutionary time. And, you know, I've just written a, a, a review paper on this where we looked at many meta-analyses and cross-cultural studies and archaeology and biology and, and even studies of, of non-human uh, primates. And a, a, a somewhat different picture emerges. You know, it turns out that actually quite often, um, well, quite often might be an overstatement, but human childhoods were uh, with regularity uh, quite harsh. And maybe the most salient feature is how variable human childhoods have been. And so if that's really salient, what you would expect is that humans have evolved a lot of phenotypic plasticity, which is the ability to adjust to different conditions based on experience, you know, to deal with various types of adversity. Okay, so it matters what the actual expected childhood is for which responses may or may not be adaptive. And that's true for self-regulation, but also for other abilities. So I want to thank the organizers for, for this uh, wonderful symposium, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much, Willem, for um, this very nice discussion. And I'd like to um, thank all six speakers today for their very inspiring talks. So we are now going to move into the uh, Q&A. Uh, we've received um, uh, many questions uh, from um, people attending the, uh, the symposium. We have selected a few questions that are representative of the main themes that emerge from the questions. However, I'd like to tell the audience that they should feel free to ask more questions through the chat and we, we would be happy to take them. And also I'd like to uh, remind our speakers that you should feel free to share any thoughts or comments you have from, um, the, from listening to uh, the other talks. But here is the first question we, um, we selected. Uh, so um, the question is about how to evaluate self-regulation and ad adaptation processes in populations living in extreme poverty. And in particular, the person who asked the question gave as examples uh, rural poverty in some parts of Latin America, Africa and Asia. So how to evaluate self-regulation and adaptation in extreme poverty. I mean, I, I'll, I'll try. Um... The, the reality is that the question is the really the best question that could be asked because how you evaluate self-regulation is, is a context and everybody's talked about how important context is for self-regulation. So there's always the introduction of measurement bias into any kind of assessment that we do um, because no assessment really asks the same question across individuals. But in general, we make assumptions that we're asking the same thing across individuals and groups. But when you talk about communities living in um, parts of the world that perhaps haven't seen as much in the way of digital media, um, and you use iPads to do your assessments, you're introducing the measurement bias. Um, and you're introducing a context in which the child has to adapt to your measurement domain before they can actually accomplish the task. And so you're making busy precisely the muscle that you're trying to assess, which is that prefrontal cortex working memory function. The, the answer to the question is, is that, in my view, of course, is you need to go in and figure out what the daily lived experience of these children is. So to assess them on what is defined as executive functions in weird populations is just bad science. Um, and I'm not going to mi mince words on that or be nice about it. It's just bad science. It's just internal validity and external validity is taught to our undergraduates is completely missing. And so you have to figure out what executive functions means in that child's community. Um, and it's not just, you know, maybe it's a focus group. Maybe you need to go embed a little bit and learn something about what it means in that community. Um, and I don't think it's it's a question of poverty. I think it's a question of lived experience, um, how you study it in uh, communities that experience violence outside of Chicago is very different than how you study it on the Upper West Side um, of Manhattan 
in kids of Columbia faculty, but we study them actually quite similarly. And I actually challenge us to think about that a little bit, um, that there really is no answer, which is why I wanted to appeal to mechanism. What is, what is self-regulation, right? It's not actually, uh, it is very well-defined. There are entire areas and literatures that do nothing but this. Nick can talk about this better than I can. So, so what mechanism are you talking about? And I think in order to do this really well, in order to answer that question, we have to understand what system we're talking about. Um, so that's, that's sort of my answer to that. Okay, thank you, Dima. Sole. Okay, well, we have another question and it says, what applications do the speakers see for parents and teachers who can support self-regulation? Could I say something before? I, I, I want to have you, to, to give you some time to think about that, but it seems that the, the answer has the same problem as the first one. So many of us, as, as Willem said, are biased, but a view of self-regulation that is very different than the speakers were describing about the complexity, the, the contextual aspect. So maybe this question should be answered, I think, taking in consideration the, this problem, that we are in a sort of uh, uh, intermediate process of changing uh, how we define, how we, how we conceptualize, and, and so on. And, and consequently, how we evaluate or assess different aspects of circulation in different contexts and in the dynamics of, of this complexity. So in this mess, uh, <laughs> what do you, because parents and teachers are consuming many, many apps. So if, if they approach you and ask this question, what uh, do you do with uh, this uh, issue and challenge? probably you will not have this time to answer them. Uh, I'm, <clears throat> go ahead, Eric. Oh, no, please go ahead. Well, I still have some, you know, thoughts on, on the first question and, and, and because nobody was saying something about the second question, I, I kind of wanted to build on Dima's answer a bit, but uh, I think Eric does have a thought on the second question. So I'll let, I'll let Eric go first. I'm right. happy to have more time to think. So if you want to build on the last <laughs> okay. question, it makes more sense to me in terms of, sorry, but yeah. Okay. Well, in that case, I'll just build a little bit. So I second everything that Dima said. I, I really agree with uh, the messages that she uh, brought across. And I would just like to add two things that I think are just completely complementary. Um, so one is, you know, um, in, in the question, the word adaptation was used, um, but exactly what it meant sort of was not 100% explicit. And, and that really matters also for what you wanna measure, for example. Um, and which timescales you want to measure things at. So, for example, if you're, you know, if you're interested in, um, in developmental mechanisms, um, you know, adapting individuals in ways that are, um, you know, adaptive from the evolutionary perspective, you, you, you know, you need to uh, take quite long, you know, timescales because um, things could be adaptive in the short run, but then there could be a cost in the long run. But what natural selection cares about is lifetime reproductive success coarsely it's actually more nuanced than that but like coarsely you could sort of say it like that um so so just measuring something in the short term would not be an appropriate way to evaluate you know adaptation if your perspective would be the evolutionary de development perspective so that's so that's sort of one thing that i think we should always be explicit about the core concepts we're using so that um and and the second thing um i wanted to mention is um in addition to you know lived experience and 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 sort of um uh, I, I think I think I think there could be more measurement of sort of contingencies in the environment um, uh, th that that would be valuable for for psychology to measure more. And so um, 
it, sort of in, in evolutionary biology and in behavioral ecology, uh, when, when people try to understand why organisms do what they do, um, people are often quite invested in quantifying the statistical structure of the environment. So, you know, uh, people take time series data on relevant variables. So it could be like rainfall in some species, but it could be, you know, um, you know, social interactions in others. And then people try to really capture the structure of the environment. And then they say, okay, so this is the context within which the organism is developing and to which it's adapting. Now, given that, you know, environmental context, which kind of strategies would quote unquote make sense for the organism to have. Um, and so I think that when psychologists are talking about, for example, you know, the development of self-regulation in an unpredictable environment, um, that's pretty, you know, nebulous until we say, okay, unpredictable at which time scale? And by unpredictable, do we mean that, you know, do we mean uncontrollable or do we mean that, um, you know, there's no autocorrelation in the environment? And are we talking about it's unpredictable from childhood to adolescence, or do we mean chaotic in an immediate sense? Are we talking about a spatial scale that's the family, or are we talking about the neighborhood level? Um, so these different temporal and spatial scales and these different notions of unpredictability actually pose different problems for individuals, and those different problems may require different adaptive strategies to solve. And so if we want to understand what are adaptive responses to the context of extreme poverty within which there you know, may or may not also be, for instance, unpredictability at certain temporal and spatial scales. I think characterizing that really well is going to be essential to understanding the fit of the behavior and the strategy to the context. And, and so I see this just as complementary to you know, um, understanding people's lived experiences and how they you know, conceptualize affordances and limits and costs and benefits and, 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 and everything else in, in their environment. But I think really quantifying the environment more um, is important. How to do that exactly in any particular case, you know, uh, depends on the specific specifics of the question. I second that. Also, I, you saw that in my presentation, it seemed like I got clipped at a couple of times because I physically did actually have to go in and clip out some stuff um, to stay on time. But actually I had a section in there about exactly what Willem just said, which is what is adaptation? What are we talking about? And it actually is a phylogenetic, initially it was a phylogenetic argument that we've adapted ourselves into ontogeny. Um, and in ways actually that I think it would really behoove us to go back to even Piaget and talk about accommodation and assimilation when we're talking about adaptation. And then Annette Karmaloff smith and talk a little bit about emergent modularity. There are a lot of people who have used different, slightly different words than we're using here, but we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. There's nothing here that we should treat as brand new ideas. These are classic ideas that um, did start with biology, but have been adapted, quote unquote, into psychology and social sciences. Um, in ways that I think if we honor sort of the, the folks who historically have brought these ideas in developmental science, we get a much broader perspective uh, than the, the one developmental scientist that stayed in my presentation was Braun from Brenner, because I think everybody's, you can just leave that in there and everybody's seen some version of the ecological um, model that he had. But, but what do you say to a parent or what do you say to a teacher is such a difficult problem because when you say something to a parent or a teacher, you assume you understand things that you may or may not understand. So there is potential for harm or damage, which is why I think you're seeing a lot of silence. Um, you know, what I do with my child is I can't take it and drop it next door in my neighbor's household. And so these are, these are really complex issues that I think make it an exciting area of study, um, but do require what Willem has said, it requires definitions. I heard self-regulation, I heard, um, you know, it could be an emotional, so VMPFC, it could be DLPFC, action-based, what are we, you know, it's different. Um, but also I heard resilience and compensation. Actually, these aren't the same thing as adaptation. You know, these are wildly different mechanisms if you were to get into the history of the sciences. And so I do think that some of that is it the definitions are really critically important if, if we want to get precise and, and actually measure these things. Thank you to both of you, Willem and Dima. Anyone want to, wants to, Eric, do you have, you, you had the chance to think anything about this? Well, I, I was really just going to echo what you said and also Dima and William in, in that 
in, in that context is so important that it's just so very difficult to try to give any any type of general advice and even even within our parent groups every parent group is different because we emphasize um, the importance of family context and family tradition. We even have a metaphor that runs through our program so that we are very clear from the beginning that we are not in any way like scientists in white lab coats saying, this is what science says you should do with your child. And it's so interesting to be a part of those groups and see these discussions between parents and how how what we're discussing with them evolves in different ways and they <clears throat> they interact with each other. So so you can even see that at a really microscopic level in, in some of these in, in some of these programs. So it's just so very difficult to give uh, advice at a, at a at a broad one size fits all level. I just couldn't agree more. And then also in terms of the program itself. Um, We've done uh, cultural adaptation work both in Oregon and in Colombia, and that's also very interesting and very important to um, to realize that you really need to go into a community to do uh, have a rigorous approach to cultural adaptation um, that involves working with the community and focus groups and 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 seeing how the program evolves in those discussions as well and then subsequently even in in pilot studies with a different group so it's just a very i agree with you sebastian it's a very difficult question to answer so broadly and, Thank you. and i'll just uh, I'll, I'll just say i mean i i'd like to to echo everything that the that the other panelists said that in the importance of um uh, addressing context, and I can just speak specifically for, for a moment about the specific inter intervention that I talked about in my presentation, attachment and biobehavioral catch-up, um, that, you know, broadly, one of the things that that intervention program targets is um, the, the construct that's termed maternal sensitivity. I, I think that that can mean a lot of different things depending on the context, and, and that's kind of explored within each individual family, but it really does kind of start to focus on the, the um, contingencies between the mother and child, the back and forth that they have in their individual interactions. But again, I, I should note that the way that that unfolds or what that looks like in any individual family um, can, can be very different. And one of the ways that the intervention program kind of tries to address context is thinking about the ways for the caregiver um, that those behaviors developed for her, that the term that's used in the intervention is thinking about her voices from the past, the way that her parenting developed from her own childhood experiences. And so again, the, the context uh, in that situation even ranges beyond the individual family, but goes back another generation to her own experience. So even within an individual intervention program like ABC, where there is a specific focus on kind of trying to um, help develop what, what could be termed healthier patterns of parent-child interaction, it becomes very context dependent and tailored as best as we can to that individual family context. Thank you, Danielle. Mariah. I would just add to, I think this brings up also the important point of, you know, creating translational efforts of conversations like this to parents and teachers, even though we don't know the full story yet, um, just kind of adding that knowledge to, um, you know, the mind of a teacher, for example, will potentially help with how they perceive children who are coming in from a home environment where they've had to regulate in a certain way that maybe doesn't match the school context. Um, so to kind of give teachers tools to, you know, help transition out of that context, for example, or, um, just maybe perhaps, you know, greater empathy and understanding for, you know, what these children are coming in with, I think is a um, important point. And I think a, one of the benefits of, of doing this kind of work and ensuring that we're also talking to the, the community leaders and um, schools and parents who are actually implementing these in, in real life. Okay, let me make a comment on the third question. Uh, I am glad to hear that you don't have nothing to sell to parents and teachers. And, the, and now I have the, the third question that is related with the one that uh, uh, one of the participants uh, made to you, Mariah, and it's about the, 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 a problem about, around the deficit hypothesis that is absolutely alive in, in the experience in Latin America in, in other sector, in the sector of uh, policy making, in the narrative of private foundations, in the people that we need to support financially the things that we are proposing. So we verify 
a gap between in, in this in the, we verify a, a scenario a context that is very difficult because we we have to convince we when I say me we I, I mean I, I mean the the researchers in this area with these kind of thoughts okay so we need to convince policymakers economists in in inter, for for example in, in in regional banks or or functionaries in private foundations for very important uh, multi, uh, companies. We need to, 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 com to convince them, and we fail frequently, to convince them that we need uh, money to support something that is very uh, away from an idea of circulation as a deficit model. Okay, so the question is, how are you dealing with these sectors in your practice as researchers? So we, we, can, we can think in a measure, for example, uh, how many how many grants uh, have been rejected in the last year uh, when you plan when you propose something at, the, at this level of complexity? Just to be sure I understand, are you getting to the point of the potential pitfalls of you know saying there might be you know strengths or adaptations in the face of poverty and that policymakers wouldn't really feel obliged to change poverty if, if we're not showcasing the deficits? Or yes, and when they uh, don't want to spend money uh, in multimodular approaches, <laughs> for example, and when, when, when we know that that is absolutely necessary. So of course, uh, Willem, there is no place for talking about hidden talents, reasonable responses. This is absolutely absent. In the, in the narratives, but words actually. So I'll let the more uh, senior faculty speak to funding considerations because I obviously don't have much experience with that yet. But I, I think this kind of point about messaging to policymakers has come up in a lot of conversations um, and is an important one, um, which is also kind of why, you know, the messaging from conversations like this today are important to, you know, be sure um, that we translate them clearly, um, just because, you know, and again, I don't think I'm, I wouldn't say we should drop deficit models altogether. I think they have a lot of, um, they yield important insights and it's important to understand, you know, where these disparities come from and to obviously, you know, um, have that moral obligation to ameliorate poverty. Um, no, that shouldn't be happening at all. Um, but, you know, at the same time, while we want to convince policymakers, we also don't want to pose um, harm or a, a greater stigma to um, families and children in poverty. And I think the messaging around fixing them can kind of, you know, become a self-fulfilling prophecy in many ways. Um, and so, you know, being mindful and careful of that messaging is important just for the actual families implicated in these things. Um, and to provide, you know, greater dignity to, you know, what they contend with and, you know, how they actually view their own responses to their um, circumstances and lived experiences. Um, and I like, you know, science is complicated. So I think it's kind of our job to be sure that we are making that complexity uh, simple and selling it to the people who are going to give us funding or make policies out of this. Um, and one metaphor I like to use kind of in, in, the, in this um, realm of whether we focus on deficits or talents or, you know, strengths is, you know, if we only studied how exercise, um, you know, tears muscle tissue down and never understood how that scarring of that muscle tissue actually builds stronger muscles, then, you know, we wouldn't really understand exercise. And so kind of ensuring we get this holistic perspective um, actually benefits not, you know, only the people who are, um, you know, living in these conditions and, and allowing them to have, um, you know, giving them more dignity for that, but also it, it provides us with more um, policies and programs that have greater integrity and a, and a greater understanding for context. I think that would make the biggest impact. Um, so I'll let, I'll stop there. I think I'm going on a long time and I'll let the um, faculty talk about uh, funding considerations for that. Thank you, Mariah. Uh, this this issue is on my mind a lot, um, and 
there's a lot to say about it, but I'll sort of try to, you know, I'll be brief. I, 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 um, I worry that, so I also, you know, I also agree that we want integrative models that incorporate various processes, including in some cases, impairment processes, if those are, you know, relevant in certain contexts and adaptation processes, of course. And, um, and I worry that, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, one thing that, that, the deficit models um, sometimes lead people to focus on are individuals and then trying to, you know, fix, um, you know, improve self-regulation in the individual and improve. And so, and I, I'm not saying that, you know, of course that that can also have, have value. Um, but to me, you know, uh, these sort of um, strength, strength-based approaches, um, immediately lead to a zooming out to the structures and the systems. Individuals, you know, are trying to make the most of a very difficult hand of cards they've been dealt. And they're responding in ways, you know, um, uh, that are, um, you know, uh, that that if, if another person would be, you know, born in that context, of course, there's heterogeneity in each context as well, but, you know, people would also develop in, in those directions. Um, and so to me, um, you know, if you say, oh, wait, well, actually, you know, many aspects of the behavior of individuals in these contexts, you know, are, shouldn't be conceptualized as deficits. They should be conceptualized as people trying to make the most of a very difficult situation. Um, and, you know, they have some strengths and they make some reasonable responses. And in some cases, for example, if there's, you know, a, uh, exposure to toxins or, you know, extreme chronic stress for a very prolonged period, there might, there might also be impairment processes operating, but really these individuals, um, you know, are trying to make the most of a really challenging context. And if we want to change something, what we need to do is, you know, change the structures and systems within which these individuals are unfortunately forced, you know, to develop. Uh, and so to me, you know, thinking about the individual as the locus, you know, of the deficit, leads people to focus on interventions on the individual perhaps i don't know that's an empirical claim and i don't know if it's true but it's it's sort of something that i sometimes think i sense whereas you know seeing the individual as responding you know just like any of us might you know growing up in in under those challenges um situates the deficit not in the individual but actually you know in the con in, in the very difficult context that that individual is forced to deal with so let's change that context uh, if if we would like the individual you know to uh, um um, you know, to grow up uh, with higher levels of well-being, better health, you know, uh, many things that that individual cares about. And let's be very sure that the individual, you know, themselves cares about, you know, uh, about these things and that it's not us imposing sort of our, you know, our norms and our, our, our values on, on the particular individual, but let's help, you know, groups develop uh, the structures and systems that they need to, you know, to thrive according to their, you know, uh, criteria um, largely. So that's- so, um, I'd, I'd echo that. And I'd, I'd also say, I think that unfortunately scientists have dug themselves into this hole with the deficit model. And I would say one, you know, the idea that as a scientist, we all train to help people is um, problematic. None of us have been trained to help anyone, frankly. Um, and I think, it's just as problematic um, as the deficit model to say that you're, you're out there to help somebody. If you're a scientist, there are ways to do that. Um, but if you're a scientist, you can't have a political affiliation like that, as far as I'm concerned, in my opinion. The data are what they are. You're there to discover things. But what ends up happening is that we do tend to have these um, you know, broad umbrellas of what our goals are. And, and, you know, we're not studying diabetes here. We're not studying heart disease. We're not actually looking to see any kind of outcomes that it, even our, our, our impairment outcomes, I keep hearing the word impairment, everything that we've looked at is within the norm, within normal variability. Nobody has any data as far as I'm, I'm aware of that shows that these children have a pathology of any kind. Um, and so I, I think this is an error in our logic frankly, um, you know, and, and so for me, the one thing going back to the question is, is if you really focus on good scientific practice and you point out where these errors in logic have actually um, cost us good science and 
cost us, you know, interpretations that are beyond our data and cost us credibility and trust with the communities we hope to work with, I think that gets you far also with funding agencies because they have been costly. These approaches, this, these, these almost missionary, we're gonna save the world, we're gonna help kids in poverty, blah, blah, blah. Frankly, like how many of us are really trained to do that without harm? I, I, I genuinely, I'm asking you genuinely, how many of you feel trained to do that in a way that's so clear that you can go ahead and make this a goal of your work? You know? I'm curious how many people feel that they can do that. And, and if you if you don't feel confident, then boy, just stick to what, what you know. If you know how to assess the measures, if you know how to do the science, if you know how to work with kids, great, do that. But boy, leave the interpretation, you know, stick within the confines of what your data can tell you. And honestly, I think the reason that, that we've got this big mess with funding agencies, and I agree, it is a big mess with funding agencies, where now everybody wants to see a brain scan next to any kind of data point in order to get it funded, even if it's completely meaningless, um, as far as furthering things, is because we've pushed these political agendas um, that, frankly, are, are outside of our realm. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I know what I just said is controversial. Wait, this is being recorded? This is being recorded, but uh, we asked about that and you, you gave us your approval. But if you have some concern, we can don't disseminate it. I am just kidding. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> but I thought, I thought about that many times during this conversation. So could anyone want to, does anyone want to comment on this now that you know that it's recording? Eric, you have a lot of experience with, I know that, with the policymakers in different countries, in different continents, South America, USA, Europe, Scandinavian I, countries, non-Scandinavian countries. I, I, I don't experience? have experience with policymakers in South America. That would be something I'd well, like to hear from you about. An economist, an economist I, in the IRB bank I, is, a, I, is a policymaker. Fair enough. I, I was I, I I I will let you speak to that because I was going to put forth at least one it just one concrete example of the type of funding that I think we need more of and it's the funding that uh, funded one of the projects I discussed and it was from in the United States the Department of Health and Human Services Association for Children and Families and it was specifically it was Head Start University Partnerships dual generation approaches and so so it was a funding mechanism that required that required a partnership between Head Start. Head Start is a federally funded preschool program in the United States for families living at or below the poverty line. And it, requ it, it required, um, it was a grant awarded to both entities essentially. And so that I feel like really, really is the type of funding that we need in, in terms of building these type, this type of interdisciplinary work. That's um, just, I don't know, maybe one, one positive example, and, and there's, there are examples here in Sweden, the School Research Institute here in Sweden requires formal written uh, documentation of collaboration with, with schools and with educators if you're going to do this, this type of, this type of uh, applied research. And so I, I think that's one, I don't know, potentially positive example. But uh, Sebastian, I'm going to let you speak to uh, issues with policymakers in, in Latin America. I really don't feel qualified, especially if I'm being recorded. Nick? Yes, so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, we also got questions about the gap that there may be between the research that's done in the lab and the uh, day-to-day activities that children do in, in, in their everyday lives. And um, so um, do you see that as problematic first? And would you have any recommendations for how to bridge the gap uh, between um, research in the lab and um, everyday experiences that children have? One one thought that I had would be to work directly with educators and parents 
and, and think about those things. So we talk about, for example, brain drain activities when we're in the parent groups with the parents and the types of, the types of fun games and activities we do, but then we encourage them to brainstorm and think about the types of activities that they like to do in their own home with their own children or in different contexts. And so um, maybe it's per perhaps a bit oversimplified, but, but to work to work directly with, uh, with, with teachers and parents to, to think about those activities. And then um, of course these activities are, are scripted to some degree, but they're very, very adaptive as well, adapt, <laughs> adaptable. Um, so uh, letting, letting teachers use their training creativity to then uh, let those types of activities evolve and fit, fit more closely to the types of experiences that the children that, they're, uh, that they have in their classrooms are having. I very much agree with that. I think building around sort of the naturalistic interactions that parents have with their children um, allows for a very sort of like real life, real world um, experience that parents can then take from, you know, the individual session into their daily lives. I, I mean, I, I think one of the things that popped into my head as we're talking about this, just thinking about policy is, um, you know, at least in the United States, I mentioned this in my presentation, but one of the things that's really can be difficult sometimes about the, the way that we develop these sort of interventions in the laboratory and then try to scale them into the real world settings is, is um, just healthcare reimbursement, you know, in the United States, um, dyadic interventions are not necessarily, you know, reimbursed by, by um, uh, health insurance providers here. So it can be really hard to provide those sorts of interventions to populations that need them. That's, you know, there, we have hints of that kind of changing, but I, I think um, one of the, the things that I'm really interested in, and I hope that we're kind of moving towards is really thinking about the ways that we develop um, interventions that are empirically supported and based on research, but that are you know, can very much be um, disseminated into the community in, in a scalable way. I'd also add that, you know, what, this is maybe a simplistic, not fully satisfying answer, but um, so Willems and Talon's model suggests, you know, maybe one of the reasons we see children in poverty performing worse um, than, you know, affluent kids on certain tasks is also because, you know, just as simple as the stimuli are not activating the systems or self-regulatory systems in the ways that they're uh, used to in their day-to-day -day lives. So developing tasks that even just include, you know, more real world stimuli, ecologically valid stimuli, things that, you know, might be more um, physiologically arousing that is more matched to maybe what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis could kind of help, um, show how they're really responding, um, you know, in, in the context of their real life. I also think there's a lot of exciting um, innovations and one of the kind of future directions in the field is moving is this kind of ecological momentary assessment, which I think is that becomes, um, you know, more accessible and doable with um, cell phones and other types of um, technology we have. I think that could also really get us to a nice, um, picture of what's kind of happening in real time and across, you know, different time scales. Sorry. Yeah. Well, related to, to Daniel's comments, we have questions regarding interventions. So what do speakers think about or have any recommendations for particularly impactful interventions targeting self-regulation. I, I am not, um, you know, I, I have limited expertise about interventions, so I'll just start with that caveat. Um, but, but my impression so far from the literature is that things, you know, the very simple inter interventions that basically amount to things like universal basic income, things that actually just reduce, you know, absolute poverty, um, that, that those can have a, a, a big impact, cascading effects throughout the system. And, and so um, we were dealing with an extremely complicated, you know, problem and we cannot probably tackle it from every possible angle but if you if you if you ask me you know 
oh, here you have, you know, like a, a billion, you know, uh, dollars or euros or some other currency. And, you know, what would you do to try to like maximally help people living, you know, um, you know, in, 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 in adverse conditions, I, I, I would go for something, you know, uh, like that based on what I've seen from the current data uh, so far. Um, and not because it enhances self, you know, uh, regulation, but because I think it improves, um, you know, people's lives in ways that matter to them. Uh, and, and also it will also, I think, um, potentially impact self-regulation. Um, um, so that would be my, that would be my two cents. Of course, I guess you know from my talk, uh, my bias, but I would argue for, well, I agree with Willem, first of all, uh, but then uh, broadly speaking, more holistic didactic interventions like ABC and some of the work we've done, there are other examples. Um, and also another potential advantage that in the context of self-regulation is perhaps not, not forgetting that happily we're learning more about uh, uh, um, a plasticity in, in young and adulthood and especially young adulthood. So there are some two generation programs that 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 focus on young young parents and employment training, more specific employment training, different aspects of uh, of the environment in in this, in addition to or sometimes in association with uh, self regulation skills um, and the potential that that these programs um, can have cascading benefits. In, in other ways, but but I, I would argue for, as we've been discussing, a more individualized, but also holistic approach. I, I certainly agree with that as well. I, just the, the quick point I'll make is, you know, I, I studied parenting interventions, so certainly have a bias towards um, thinking about that. But that being said, I realized that a lot of these parenting interventions really do put a lot of onus and a lot of kind of burden on on parents when they're in difficult situations. So I also think that um, the, the the broader, more holistic interventions that also enable parents to parent in the ways that are, are helpful for their children is, is really important, kind of trying to lift a little bit of the, the burden off parents. And so things like, um, you know, poverty reduction are, are certainly fall, fall into that category too. Okay, if nobody else has anything to say, we have to, to close this symposium, we have arrived to the end of, of this meeting. So we hope you have all find this meeting to be as interesting as, and motivating as we have. And we want to thank you, Mariah, Daniel, Eric, Dima, Robin, and Dylan for sharing your knowledge and your considerations on this topic. We want to thank you for your efforts and your kind disposition. We remind you that the webinar will be available in the YouTube channel, so if you want to share it. And we thank all the assistants either for your participations. And well, we, we desire you to enjoy the rest of the day. And thank you. If I may take the liberty, I propose that we all unmute and applaud for the organizers, and in particular Soledad, who's done so much. Thank you.